Greetings everybody, I'm Gerd Leonhard, Futurist in Zurich, Switzerland, and this is Gerd Talks. I have decided to do a special episode about the whole discussion about calming down with AI, taking a pause, hitting the reset button, thinking about a moratorium, and just as I was doing that and speaking in Delhi, India just two days ago, the Future of Life Institute came out with an open letter signed by some, I don't know, thousand people now, I, I signed it as well. Let's see if I'm going to get listed or not. But uh, AI luminaries from all over the place, not from OpenAI, of course, but Elon Musk signed it. Uh, so it's a quite serious thing. And I, you know, no matter what you think about Elon, I think this is a, an interesting turn of events. You can check it out at the Future of Life Institute. Um, and I will have a URL in, in the scan later. You can, you can take a look. But it's, uh, it's pointing out the need to take a pause and step back and ask, you know, why are we doing this? And who is in charge? And I'm going to talk about what that means. I'm going to take your questions a little bit later so we can discuss what it all means. First, I want to say, hey, uh, I use AI. Right? I use this thing called RunwayML.com, Runway. It's a really cool app that allows me to redo video and organize myself as a, as a different person in the video and also uh, work with graphics and do all these kind of things that required major amount of programming and, and Adobe After Effects before. I still have my Adobe After Effects people doing that for me. But this is a great tool. I also love what it does with images. You know, makes me look a lot younger and more attractive. And, you know, these are from uh, Lens and the other ones I, I think from um, another AI banner that I use. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it makes me look good. So I, I do like that part of it. Um, but I'm a little bit worried, I have to say. I'm worried about what's happening in the progression as we're going from assistant intelligence IA to more automation, to more augmented intelligence, uh, which means basically just getting better and better and better, and then all the way uh, to autonomous intelligence. And I think autonomous intelligence is not what we would want. As uh, you know, has been said many times before, also by Stuart Russell, who wrote the book on AI, that really what we want is uh, AI to be getting the job done, right? And to be, uh, to be just doing the right thing, uh, to be competent, not to be conscious. Yeah? Why would we want autonomous intelligence? And that seems to be the goal in this whole discussion about chat GPT, generative conversational AI, to build something that goes towards AGI. I think that is the wrong approach. I also think we must differentiate in this progression between IA, intelligent assistance, and AI, which is kind of what's the next stage of things, and that's, in my view, unavoidable, and AGI, the general intelligence. And, and this is really, I think, what the whole discussion should be all about. How do we facilitate IA and AI to be a benefit for everybody? And how do we flatten out the economic curve there? And how do we uh, prepare for jobs and education? And then that the, the question at the end is, how do we avoid an AI taking over that becomes generally intelligent in whatever that time be would be? I think Kurzweil says 2030, I tend to agree. It's not that far away. And that could be the end of it if, we don't, if we're not prepared, if we don't collaborate on a global level. I think this is what the whole Future of Life Institute uh, open letter is about. It's about resetting and asking that question, how do we control it at the very end? Not how do, how do we deal with the side effects of IA only, but how do we actually make it we safe? We are at the iPhone moment of AI. Startups are racing to build disruptive products and business models while incumbents are looking to respond. Generative AI has triggered a sense of urgency in enterprises worldwide to develop AI strategies. Customers need to access NVIDIA AI easier and faster. NVIDIA Accelerated Computing starts. Well, that's very interesting what NVIDIA does, dear Jensen. But I think this is part of the problem right now. We're seeing AI um, becoming a huge business, a trillion dollar business. Probably the business, uh, the biggest business opportunity ever is to turn humans into machines and vice versa <laughs> and to essentially build a human machine. And I think great that we need all this processing power and the GPUs that Jensen sells and sells. And I think, you know, he's, a, he's an interesting and probably well-meaning man. But what is the question apart from huge revenue streams and huge new possibilities with AI? And the question is about purpose. It's about where we're going to go with this. And so pausing the giant AI experiments as the uh, Future of Life Institute is proposing is a good idea.
Right? It's a good idea for many reasons because right now there's kind of a crazy moment. First, the Sputnik moment of open AI and then the moment of the moon landing. Allegedly, we went to the moon, some people would believe. But that's probably true. But now, of course, Microsoft wants to go to the moon, and Google wants to go to the moon, and Baidu and all. Everybody else wants to do the, go to the moon and, and beat the Sputnik moment. Right? But I think if we look at what OpenAI is, uh, is doing and what the Future of Life Institute is, uh, is uh, setting forth, you know, I'm going to read this for you because I think it's really, really, really important to keep this in mind. Contemporary systems are now becoming human competitive at general tasks, and we must ask ourselves, should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth? Should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, uh, and obsolete and replace us? Should we risk the control of our civilization? That is a really, really good way of putting it. It's what I've been thinking all along. That's why I'm so excited about seeing the open letter. In the second paragraph, it gets better or worse, depending on what you, how you want to see it. Such decisions must not be delegated to unelected tech leaders. Powerful AI systems should be developed once we are confident that their effects will be positive, positive and their risk will be manageable. I couldn't agree more. It's really nailing it down in a, in a very good way. We need to work together until we can manage the risks so we don't end up in the same place than we did with the oil economy, which is all the risks and the externalities were, were pushed off to people and the government and paying the bill for, for, for the cleanup, so to speak. And we see where that has gotten us. And social media, which I talk about, same story. Right? So that continues on the, next, on the next page of this uh, declaration, which I really love. This, we call an AI to immediately pause for at least six months for the AI labs to pause and to think about pausing the training that goes beyond GPT-4. I think that is a very, very good way to put it. This pause should be public and verifiable and include all key actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted, we should have a moratorium. And that is just unavoidable in my view. Six months is a very short time. We need public uh, officials, politicians, governments to be involved in this conversation. The UN, everybody, uh, to think about a moratorium, artificial general intelligence. This is a global concern. It's not just a military concern, I'm sure, between China, Russia, and the US, and other countries that are shooting in this direction, including, of course, India and other countries. I mean, this is something to think about. Do we need a moratorium? I think that's kind of unavoidable. The second part of this, AI labs and independence should use this pause to jointly develop and implement a set of shared safety protocols for advanced design and development that are rigorously audited and overseen by independent outside experts, hopefully better than the Facebook board. These protocols should ensure that systems are adhering to a safe and reasonable doubt standard. So this is really, really, really important. And that, that's why I, you know, I printed this out and, and hung it on the wall by myself, you know, repeating what I've been saying for years. This does not mean a pause on AI, on developing AI, merely a stepping back from the race to ever predictable black box models with emerging capabilities. That is really what it's all about. So this text is really sort of the gold mine behind this whole conversation I've been having. Uh, also on my book, Technology Versus Humanity, for the last couple of years I've been talking about what exactly that means. That book, by the way, is here and is still pretty much up to date, even though it's six years old, you know, it's mind boggling how hope has come back to you. Uh, so basically, we need to think about and refocus this whole conversation uh, about what AI is up to. So that is really, really important. Should be refocused on today's meaning, right? We have to actually put the purpose back into this whole thing. So, and Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, of course, hasn't signed this agreement or this open letter quite yet. Uh, he probably won't, but he would be smart if he did, in my view. And he says the coming change of AI will uh, center around the most important human issues, the phenomenal ability to think, create, understand, and to reason. And that is really what makes us human. And he says we're moving to the AI revolution because of this, clearly that obviously the case, but the revolution will generate enough wealth for everyone to have 
what they need. I mean, of course, this is kind of techno utopia that's quite typical for Silicon Valley because to, to produce what everybody needs, we need a lot more than technology, but this may be a step towards it. But he does say at the end, if we as a society manage it responsibly, right? I mean, this is the key to manage responsibly. And we haven't done that. We haven't done that with social media. We haven't done that with telecoms, with the Internet of Things and big data and cloud computing. Uh, and of course, uh, healthcare, digital healthcare. We have to think about managing all these things responsibly with regards to the externalities. And that to me is the crucial point. You know, how do we manage responsibility when machines have the ability to think and create and to reason as this little animation shows us, you know, where machines can actually start to ponder about the, the state of the world and then nod their head and, try and understand it. We're only like 10 years away from this. So this is something we have to think about. How do we control a computer that understands the world, that has an IQ of a billion? And is it controllable? Should it be? I think it should be and it must be, but many people are saying it will be impossible to do so. So good time to think about what would happen when we have a machine that is starting to create most of the text and images and videos and films and people. Right? We're moving into a synthetic future where everything is made by a machine, put together by algorithms. Uh, that is a scary thought. What kind of lens will we have when we get to that point? And who is in charge of this? Will it be one of the tech companies? Will it be like social media, where only a few players are in charge as to what we read and nobody is really accountable? That's a very sad state of affairs. If most content is synthetic, how will we know reality? How do we know who to trust? Imagine if you could speak to your mobile phone and you can just ask a question and then you get a, a, a reply spoken back to you. Imagine 800 million Indians that are now online doing that and asking for the results. And then we have to make sure there's some truth in there and some verifiable facts. Otherwise, democracy is finished. So, big topic. Uh, I think we'll talk about that in the questions. But imagine what will happen when the whole thing goes to voice, which it is just now doing. And the genie comes out and just answers questions. And, and a lot of people that use these kind of apps are not going to be very critical about the answer. This, I call this a Google Maps problem. You know, Google Maps is amazing, but it's very often wrong. And we know it. But would we know it with an app like this? You know, with a, with a kind of uh, possibility of sounding like a human and sounding super smart and being the perfect stochastic parrot, as some people have said. I'm not going to talk about the parrot today. Anyway, this could be heaven or it could be hell. And the heavenly part, of course, is really quite simple. We can possibly, in a generative AI, uh, use uh, efficiency and productivity gains and offloading commodity jobs and moving those up the food chains and save lots of money in, in, in jobs that are essentially commodity, or parenthesis, donkey work, that many of us are doing every single day. And I was just in India where 20 million people work in the call center economy. That's a great example. That will be a bad event for those people. But, you know, we can boost knowledge work and research and discovery. My work is going to be a lot faster, is already faster using chat GPT-4, where I can ask questions and prepare for gigs and, and drill into research, makes my work faster. But a lot of other things, of course, will have serious side effects, but this is a plus, maybe not heaven, that will be a, a bit of a stretch, but it's a, it's a plus for productivity and efficiency. And the hell part comes in quite cl clearly when we look at this and we're saying, okay, the hell could be more alternate realities, you know, more illusions, uh, more hallucinations of half-baked truth, more bias, more errors. I mean, the bias is in there, of course. This internet version is mostly American. So how would European values, or let's say Indian languages, 367 of them, and the philosophy there being put into this whole conversation, they just wouldn't. And the machine would just kind of ignore that because it's not in the database yet, for the most part. More automation of human narratives, more things that we would just do because we're lazy, naturally lazy, so to speak. We just let the machine do the job and, and tell the story and write, write the story in the newspaper and make the television plot. More reductionism, boiling the world down to like very simple facts, cookie cutter stuff, because that's what the AI sees. It only sees the obvious, right? the, the things that are right in front of us. Uh, it doesn't see anything that's not about emotions and intuition and, and uh, spirituality, any of those things. More dehumanization and more de-skilling 
Uh, that is something that we have inadvertently gotten, of course, from the internet, but also from social media, that we haven't done anything about. We're not prepared for this. Uh, to be prepared, I think we really do need to stop and pause and think about what are the implications and who is responsible. Instead of just going ahead and looking for money and saying, okay, this uh, chat GPT, generative AI, AI, AGI will be a gold mine. Clearly it could be. But what is a gold mine if we don't have a place where we can enjoy the gold? You know, when we find a place where basically we have a lot more money, but the world as we know it is coming to an end because we're going to be merging with the machines. Let's keep in mind the way that machines see reality is a totally cut down version of what we see in reality. Reality isn't binary. You know, uh, machines see the world in a 90% reduction, which is about language. And again, the, the parrot idea, right? It's a fancy autocomplete, basically. Yes, and, and it's getting better and it's getting smart, parenthesis, but it doesn't see the world like you and me, like humans, allegedly humans are watching, uh, seeing, seeing it like this. It doesn't. Right? We have ears and eyes and we experience the world in a whole 360 degree fashion impossible for a machine. This little clip here from the Stones really shows it very nicely. I mean, the whole, uh, I can't play the video, it's, it's a song called Start Me Up. I'm sure you're vaguely familiar with that, the Boston Dynamics spot, because if I play the video, I'll get banned on YouTube on this video because of the sound and those holy copyright laws. But a couple of key points on this. First, learning is not about memorizing, downing inf uh, downloading information and regurgitating it. So that's what machines do. We don't do that. We learn in a plastic flexible way. We're always changing things. We're always taking in all input. Intelligence is not just data processing. For machines it is, but not for us. We're processing real life. Right? Humans don't think with just the brain. I mean, everybody that's in psychology or psychotherapy or biology even, or even technology can tell you that we don't think. We think with the body. We think with absolutely everything. It's very hard to figure out, you know, with left brain, none of, none of that is left brain, right brain stuff, right? It's just not real. Speaking is not the same as thinking. Just because an app can speak doesn't mean it's thinking. It's just doing the parrot thing. And I don't want to harp on the parrot too much because it's kind of oversimplification, but humans aren't binary like data. We are multinary. We can think several different disparate things at the same time, and we can find me meaning without any language. And we have a fuzzy environment and we, we can do all these things at the same time. And real life goes beyond data. Most importantly, logic alone is not enough. People say, that's an old, I think, saying from um, Guinea, right? knowledge without wisdom is like water in the sand. We can have lots of knowledge, but if it's not in the right context and the right combination, then it just kind of trickles away and it means very little. And also, you know, a lot of logic and knowledge without uh, uh, understanding and without concern and without consciousness can be very dangerous too, uh, not in humans and in machines. So logic alone is not enough and humans are all sensing. Huh? We sense the world totally like this where we experience it in many different ways. I think the best possible camera lens, for example, today captures three to five percent of the human eye, the possibilities. And then, of course, it captures different things as well, which is really interesting. But it makes a good combination, in my view, as long as we don't overdo it. And, you know, do a, too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. So, great saying here. I think this is originally from Ariana, Ariana Huffington. Uh, algorithms know the logic of everything, but the feeling of nothing. Imagine living in the world run by an AI and by algorithms that has feelings for nothing. It cannot identify feelings, values, ethics, purpose, any of those things. I mean, that could be a very, very dark future. I think we don't want to go down that road by just saying, well, machines can be better politicians or, you know, uh, better therapists. I mean, there's people seriously thinking about these things. I think it's just crazy when we think about this idea of a handshake between humans and machines. We must think about how our part is being kept up, how we protect what makes us human. And what makes us human? Right? Of course, uh, compassion, empathy, emotions, understanding, foresight, all the things that machines know nothing about. Very important that we focus on balance and safety, security, ethics, control. And that is part of the proposal, I think, of the Future of Life Institute, is that we sit back and say, well, how do we actually make that be part of the program. 
or how do we carve out human inefficiency? We're going to need a moratorium on many of those issues you know, to allow inefficiency. That's counterproductive. Right? We, if we don't allow inefficiency, we won't exist. And I always say half jokingly that if an AI was put to the task of dealing with climate change, it would first say, well, let's kill all humans because it's the most logical approach. You know, we'll just completely solve the problem. So the question really is one of purpose. Why are we doing this? What is it supposed to do? And I think really the Future of Life Institute a pledge uh, comes down to boiling down this idea about what the goal is in capitalism. You know, how we're going to go from this focus on profit and growth to a larger story, people, planet, purpose, prosperity, as I call it. That's underneath all of those discussions. If we're just going to look up for money, we're just going to go full length into basically mechanizing humans and uh, humanizing machines. <laughs> that would not be a very good future for us and the outcome would be dark. As we can see here on social media, if asked here by the Atlantic Council, what by 2023, if social media is going to be a net positive or negative, most people say, well, 53% and quite a few others right, uh, are saying, no, it's not going to be a net positive. And how do we make sure that AI is a net positive? Well, that's currently not in the agenda of the companies that are putting it out there. I think Microsoft is making a great effort. Clearly, but it shouldn't just be up to one company, obviously. There needs to be standard, a rule, you know, a council, a, a program, a moratorium ultimately on the side effects because technology has no ethics. And I would say that some tech companies do have ethics. Apple, maybe Microsoft, maybe others. Yeah, that is question to be discussed. Facebook, in my view, has lost ethics a long time ago, as I'm sure you're aware of my Facebook rants on this, but I'm not going to get into this now. Technology has no ethics and we need to put the ethics in. We are in charge of this. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have the right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. And that is just so crucial. We need to know what is the right thing to do. Right now we are lost in this. Is it the right thing to do to just launch this and let people use it and, and change society by impact of technology? Or should we just think a little bit further? I think we need a pledge. I call this the technocratic oath, uh, like the oath that a doctor takes. I will place human decency over potential technological gains in all cases. That's the pledge I want to see from all the AI companies, from the AI scientists, from the AI community, and of course from, from the governing systems around the world. Basically, human potential and human decency and human flourishing has to be the top objective of course, human means planet as well. Let's not forget that. It doesn't just mean humans. It means all of us living here. So when I made the film last year, the Good Future film, it came back to me as an answer to this whole conversation about this open letter. Right? We are to be architects of the future, not its victims. I feel that if we don't take a stop now, we sit back and we discuss and we find common ground by everybody around the globe, US, Europe, China, India, Brazil and so on, right, then we're going to end up being the victims of what we have invented. And uh, I think the chances are low for that to happen because we have those initiatives and we have a lot of great people helming those initiatives and a lot of great researchers also get involved on various sides. So I just want to kick off this debate to see if that is the suitable way because to me the good future is not an AI arms race. It's not about an IA arms race, you know, intelligent assistance either, because ultimately it's about human flourishing, it's about collective benefit, sustainable capitalism, if that is even possible, or that is the word. The good future is not about who's going to win this race, China, US, or, or, or of course Russia that has claimed they want to reach that goal as well of AI. But AGI really worries me. General intelligence of machines, that worries me for a lot of reasons. And I think it's a lot more powerful than nuclear. It's a much bigger danger than climate change. It's a real and present danger moving into the next decade. We're going to need, I have suggested many times, a Human Futures Council. And I've uh, called this before, I've called this a Digital Ethics Council in my book. So I've just kind of mutated this on. It's really about the future of humanity here. Uh, and we have to get together and figure out how we're going to get enough smart people and clued in people and people who are going beyond logic right, to, to bring this in, how we're going to collaborate on a global level. That, that, is the, that is the agenda. 
I'd be happy to contribute in many ways that I can and I have. Right? But you know, there's a lot of great people out there who are quite suitable for this, to bring this onto our agenda and to think about this. Um, and of course the UN is very much involved with this as well and um, the um, sustainable development goals go in this direction as well. So I salute the UN for doing that, but we need to look further. And this is the time to do it. This is the time to take a break and take a look and say, how do we collaborate? How do we make the best out of this situation? Quoting my book as a final uh, uh, thing that I think will wrap this up quite nicely. We should embrace technology, but not become technology. So I salute um, this initiative, the open letter, and I think it's really, really important that we review and sign it and spread the word. As I know right now, the open letter, it can't really be signed because there are too many people having signed it. I think it's kind of in a holding pattern right now, but here's the, the URL where you can spread the word and you can take a look and you can tweet about it. So. Thanks very much for listening, and now I'm going to switch over to our live conversation. Um, really appreciate all of you being here and listening to what I have to say. Thanks, and let's continue.